this room be shaped. Let our hearts be broken. Let your church true peace to Jerusalem 
Thank you for the restoration that has come for the Jewish people in the last 80 years. I pray that you would continue to pour out your favor on the state of Israel. We pray that you would reveal your divine wisdom to key national leaders to establish abiding peace and harmony to their land. Only with your supernatural intervention and revelation can lasting peace prevail in Palestine. Restore your rightful place as the God of Israel and reveal Jesus as Messiah, the Savior of the Jews. Bring revival and awakening to Jewish communities around the world that their eyes would see that Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, is the true fulfillment of all their promises, prophecies, rabbinic laws and traditions, as well as their hopes and dreams for their people. Expand and deepen our understanding of what it means for us as Gentiles to be grafted into the roots of Jewish heritage. Only when Jesus is lifted high and exalted in all nations can Jerusalem truly be restored in all its glory and enduring shalom shall reign. Father, would you bring this to pass in your power and in your love? Lord, hear our prayer. Hey Antioch, we are Rachel and Jordan Irvin and family. We are here in Nepal and we are excited today to do the Lord's Prayer. Uh, but we're not just going to do it once, we're going to do it twice. Uh, the Irvin family is going to do it in English. And then Deborah Didi, our very close friend, uh, our honestly our family here in Nepal, our Nepali family, uh, she's going to say the Lord's Prayer after, only she's going to say it in Nepali. All right, so we're going to go ahead and bow our heads and we are going to start the prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, holy is your name. Thy kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For in yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and forever. Amen. 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 मेरो परिवार मिलेर हामी नेपालको लागि अनि अमेरिकाको लागि प्रार्थना गर्दछौं प्रभु सबै प्रकारको सुरक्षा तपाईबाट रहेको होस् भनी प्रार्थना गर्छौं सबै परिवार तपाईको हातमा अर्पण गर्दै येशु ख्रीष्टको नाममा आमेन आमेन थ्यांक यू अनि आर्क वी लव यू दिस इज पार्ट अफ आवर सर्विस वेयर वी ऑनर द लॉर्ड विथ आवर गिविंग दिस मॉर्निंग वेयरएवर यू आर टुडे आई वांट टु इन्वाइट यू टु जस्ट टु पॉज विथ अस नाउ आई नो फॉर मी I'm giving in a different way. So I'm giving via text or online and it takes a little bit, it can take a little bit of the meaningfulness out of the giving act. And what we're hoping to do as we record this for our video services is it gives us an opportunity, even if you've given earlier in the week or even if you're gonna give later this week, it gives us an opportunity right now just to pause and say, Father, everything that we have comes from you and we're so grateful for the fruit of our labor that we can bring to you as worship and honor, whether that be in the form of a tithe or whether that be in the form of an offering. Right now, I wanna invite you to pray together with me out of a heart of gratitude, out of a heart of worship and obedience, as we just say, Father, we're giving back unto you what you've blessed us with. So I wanna invite you to read this prayer in the form of a prayer, just pray this together with us this giving liturgy. God is the source of our lives and the giver of all good things. All that we have comes from his generous hand. We give today in worship, faith, and obedience, trusting that God will receive the fruit of our labors and bless the world. Godliness with contentment is great gain. We bring nothing into this world and we take nothing out of it. We who call Jesus Lord devote ourselves to resisting greed, which plunges the human hearts into ruin and pierces it with many grief. We are determined to practice generosity with free hearts, fixing our hope on God and not the uncertainty of wealth. We desire to be rich in good deeds and willing to share all that we have, 
laying up for ourselves a treasure that will not decay, but will shine in the age to come. Amen. Thank you for your giving, friends. God bless you. Good morning, Antioch Church and all of our friends and family and guests who are joining us today on this Pentecost Sunday. So excited to be together with you here in your homes, in your apartments, in your living rooms today to talk about the beauty and the wonder and the function of the Holy Spirit for today, mm -hmm. for now, for you and for me. So grab your Bibles. We're going to have just a wonderfully riveting time talking about the person of the Holy Spirit and his relevance for the body of Christ and the church, which are both the same thing mm. today. Ex True. Yeah. So let us pray and we'll jump right in. Father, thank you so much today that you are here and that you are near, oh God, that you are with us, that you are near to us. Holy Spirit of the living God who dwells inside of those who call themselves followers of Jesus. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you dwell within us, revealing Jesus to us, revealing the Father to us, teaching us all things, leading us into all truth. And today, right now, right now, Holy mm -hmm. Spirit, I am asking today that every single person who views this video, that you would be near to them. Amen. I'm asking today, Holy Spirit, that those that are far away from God, that those who have legitimate questions about who God is, Holy Spirit, would you reveal Jesus today, right now, to all of our friends who are watching. And Spirit of the living God, we ask that you would comfort us, that you would uh, draw us today, right now, draw us into the fellowship mm -hmm. of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We're going to begin this morning reading from Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Wow, bro, that was awesome. Timing. We're you getting are, this. We are getting it this. It took 10 weeks, but I'm on track now. Man, I'm loving that, man. Well, hey, uh, you know, in my tradition, and I believe, in, you know, in our tradition growing up as young Pentecostals mm -hmm. and young Charismatics, uh, this, we know about Pentecost. We know about Pentecost. But we know about Pentecost, I think, more from an experiential standpoint. It's funny mm -hmm. because, at least in my church, um, you know, Pentecostal in terms of the life of the Spirit, the gifts of the Spirit, the corporate working and the nature of the Spirit is definitely something that we participated with. But it's not like we really gave a lot of attention to Pentecost Sunday right. from a theological or a church calendar mm -hmm. standpoint. I don't know if that was your experience. It was. Yeah. yeah. And so in terms of like Resurrection Sunday, there's this space in between Easter and Pentecost. I mean, all of that was was just absolutely you know foreign to me. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, tell us, if you would, a little bit about what is Pentecost Sunday, both historically and biblically. So Pentecost Sunday is the day that we celebrate a number of things. One, it is the day that we celebrate the birth of the church. It is also the day that we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit to indwell the apostles and those who are present in Acts 2 and now us believers, we believers. Um, something that I didn't know for a really long time is that Pentecost was not something that was initiated in Acts 2. That Pentecost was a Jewish holiday mm. that was the feast where they celebrated the harvest, which is interesting knowing, of course, what comes right after these pass the passage that you just read where Peter 
preaches, stands and boldly proclaims that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and then thousands are added. And we see throughout the first half of the book of Acts, just one time after another, it's these massive groupings of people that are mm. added to the body of Christ. So it's not an accident that it comes on this holiday. So Pentecost mm. was um, 50 days after Passover. And of course, we know now that the crucifixion and the resurrection are associated, depending on which gospel, right around that time of right. Passover. Right. So then Pentecost is 50 days later, and this is where we celebrate the Holy Spirit coming and tongues of fire and then indwelling these believers here. And yes. of course, now we celebrate that also in just about the same amount of time after Resurrection Sunday. Yeah, So that's so good. Yeah. So uh, this is not a question that we prepared for. Mm. I love doing this to Jonathan. I love it's like so walking through all of our questions, it's riveting. getting ready, getting aligned, and then me just throwing these curveballs. It's it brings me so much joy. Really it, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Um, so what I was going to ask you is, um, you know, when I became more and more familiar with, um, you know, the study of pneumatology, mm. which is just very simply the study of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And this is the crowning verse, right? Yes. This is one of those crowning verses for the study of the Holy Spirit, particularly from a charismatic dimension mm -hmm. or perspective. And yet, the more I've been exploring theologically, there's way more that's going on here at mm -hmm. Pentecost ecclesiologically yes. than there is just pneumatologically. And, and to translate, that very simply means that this is not just a set of verses right. that are about the charismatic nature of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. that there's, there's really um, very, very significant moves that are being placed here on the church. Yes. Can, can you talk absolutely. to that? And to be very clear, yeah. we both absolutely believe in the charismatic gifts of the Spirit. Yes, we do. And this... This is one of the crowning verses. It's just, it's not less than that, it's more than that. It's more that. expansive Good. than we've yeah. known. Yeah. So one of the passages that is often read and preached on Pentecost Sunday is the passage from, I believe, Genesis 11, 10, 11, somewhere in there with the, the Tower of Babel. Yes. And that passage, of course, we know is uh, the, the people who were alive in that particular time, they gather and they try and build a tower to get up to heaven. And God speaks down and confuses the languages. Right. And so some have preached Acts chapter 2 as a reversal of the Tower of Babel. That there is this, so in, instead of man coming up, the tongues of fire and the spirit come down. Yeah. And also there is this speaking in other tongues that is a correlation between the two passages. But I think looking at it as a reversal of Babel is probably not the best thing. And this does come into ecclesiology here in the church. So at Babel, there was this, this forced unity that seems like when God confuses their language, then they are scattered into disunity. Mm. And w what we see here, I wouldn't say is the reversal of that, but it's the overcoming of Babel. So what do I mean by that? So it, it's not the reversal back to this uniformity of everyone speaking one language, everyone living in one city. I don't think that that's at all what God is after. And I mean, it's certainly from the end of Revelation, we see that all the tribes, yes. all the tongues, yes. all the languages. Thank God for it. Amen. So I don't think what God is after is uniformity, but the cliched phrase, unity, unity in diversity. diversity right. And that's what we see here. We see them speaking not in a singular tongue, but in other tongues. And yeah. we know that there were Jews from other nations present. Yeah. So it is as if God has, has allowed this story to be brought back in where man tried to ascend to God. And what we see in Acts 2 is God descends to man, which is the same thing that happened in the incarnation, and meets them where they are at but breaches this unity and diversity thing where now this is for the sake of mission 
for the whole world, yes. but in unity. Yes. So the Spirit is the unity of the church yes. so that they can now go and be witnesses to Christ in all of the world. Yeah. And this is what we celebrate in the day of Pentecost. We celebrate this is the birthday of the church. Also, as you said in the introduction, the body of Christ, yeah. which when we get into the passages in John, we're going to look at the correlation between the Spirit and Christ mm -hmm. and what it is to be Christ's body and continue His work, mm -hmm. etc. So those are some of the ecclesiological themes there. That I yeah. love it. That's so beautiful. You know, the thing that I would add to that very simply is on this idea of this is the birth yep. of the church, that the church was birthed in the Holy Spirit by the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And how critical, essential, how crucial, how valuable, invaluable yes. the Holy Spirit is to the church truly being the church mm -hmm. of Jesus. Absolutely. Right? The church is not simply a social structure. Mm -hmm. It's not simply a social entity. It's not simply a religious structure. Mm -hmm. That the church lives or dies right. Right? on the presence and on the power and on the dynamic life yes. of the Holy Spirit working in mm -hmm. us and through us. Absolutely. And so we say, come Holy yes. Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, right. our passages today are actually not in Acts chapter 2. Our passage that mm. we're going to really launch today from is in John chapter 20. Mm -hmm. And so let us just move a couple of pages backwards from Acts chapter 2. This is actually a passage that we read yes. right after Easter, I believe. And we said on the video, we're going to hold off from talking too much about the Holy Spirit because yeah. we knew that this particular verse was coming on this Absolutely. particular day. So beginning in John chapter 20, verse 19, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus, Jesus came and he stood among them and he said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. There's that missional dynamic again that mm -hmm. you just gave reference Same. to in Acts chapter 2. We can never divorce the ministry and the presence of the Holy Spirit from the missional heart of God. We Absolutely. can't do it. Right. And we don't want to get off on too much of a tangent, but if we're not careful, the Holy Spirit can almost be just this kind of sensationalist circus show that mm -hmm. that is, you know, fulfilling something inside of us, but it's devoid of the missional heart of God. Absolutely. And we have to be very, very careful about that. So moving on here, verse 22, and with that, he breathed on them and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Receive the Holy Spirit. I receive. I receive. <laughs> we have and are receiving. And exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Talk to us a little bit about some of the, the historical and the contextual realities of what's going on right here before we dive into a little bit more of the practical nature of who the Holy Spirit is for us. Man, well, in an effort to keep this as enlivening, in alignment with the Spirit as possible... <laughs> You know, one of the themes that we haven't really talked about, there's so many themes in the book of John. It seems like every message that we're talking about John, it's, well, one of the themes of the book of John. Um, and one of them really is the way that John is continually, so John, in, one of the distinctions between he and the synoptic gospels is that John is retelling the story in a completely different way. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are, are telling the story from their various perspectives. Right. But John, it's like it's like Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Luke are all looking at Jesus and, and following the story like this. And John is more from a heavenly perspective. Mm -hmm. And we see this right up front in the beginning. John establishes this and he's drawing on the passage from Genesis mm -hmm. where he says, in the beginning was the Word. Right. So John establishes that Jesus was present 
in the beginning before there was anything at all. You bet. And this is the same Jesus that we see in 14, 15, 16, and now here in 20, who is mm-hmm. speaking, giving this, mm-hmm. these elaborate prayers and this elaborate teaching. So John has a different perspective altogether because his agenda, I think, is different. Mm-hmm. So he draws constantly back to Genesis. Mm-hmm. And we see this in Genesis 1. If I, just, I just mentioned that. Uh, we see the passage there with uh, Nathaniel, where he talks about, Nathaniel, I saw you under the fig tree. And of course, if we think a little bit more deeply about that, where else do we remember a mm. reference to that? Well, Adam and Eve in the mm. garden, they hid themselves with fig leaves. Yeah. So it's, it's almost as if he's saying, I saw you before you were, wow. and I've seen you in your sin, and yet I am still here, Amazing. and you will see greater things wow, than these. That's fascinating. I mean, so it's like chapter after chapter, there are these allusions back to Genesis. So let's skip here to chapter 20. Obviously, we just saw peace be with you, and he breathed on them and you said, bet. receive the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Well, where else does God breathe into people? There's right. a couple of places, Ezekiel 37, of course. Yes. But let's go back even before that. Genesis chapter 2, yeah. where he forms them, yep. he breathes his life into them, right. and then he places them in the garden. Yep. So where we might say Acts 2, we see the, the Pentecost is the establishing the birthday of the church, if you will. Mm-hmm. Here, it seems as if John is doing something very similar, but slightly different. It's the establishing of the new creation. Mm. So he's going back to the original creation. Mm -hmm. So now we have the resurrected Christ breathing life into the apostles. This is now the new creation. Yeah. So that's, that's a little bit of the context here, you know, of of what exactly is being established in this moment. It's like John is highlighting that the giving of the Holy Spirit is tied so closely to Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. resurrection. Yeah, Yeah, absolutely marvelous. I I agree with that. That reference is in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, for those of you who want to take a look at that. where uh, And I'll just read that very quickly. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils. He imparted the Mm -hmm. breath of life into the nostrils, and then man became a living yes. being, right? So here in John chapter 20, and we talked a little bit about this when we went through these passages in John chapter 20 post-resurrection. Mm. And we were talking about the fact that when Jesus is having his discourse with the disciples, beginning in John 13, 14, 15, and 16, mm-hmm that so many of the things that he's saying to his disciples in that intimate moment before he's about uh, to lay his life down. Mm -hmm. uh, In John chapter 20, it's like immediately he's making reference. Yes. Like I'm coming back and I'm fulfilling all those things that I spoke to you Mm -hmm. in that in that place. And 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 so let's let us just go backwards here to John chapter 14 and let's connect some dots here. So immediately Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I will return to you. And when I do, you will know that I am he. And so, boom, Jesus shows up in John chapter 20. Immediately he fulfills that. He tells the disciples, peace, I leave with you. And I say all these things so that you can have peace, even though that in this world you will have trouble. The first thing that Jesus says to them is peace, Mm -hmm. right? And multiple times. And multiple times, exactly. And then uh, Jesus talks about their joy. And mm-hmm. then it says right here in John chapter 20 that immediately the disciples were overjoyed yeah. that they see Jesus. Well, there's some of the best theological verses about the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. in John 14, 15, and 16. Yes. Jesus says to these guys, receive the Holy Spirit. Let's take a look, if we would, over in John chapter 14. And we will begin right here in verse 17. John chapter 14. Uh, In fact, I'm going to read verse 16 just because that's where he begins the introduction. And we've touched on this verse before as well. And I will ask the Father, Jesus speaking, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate. Yes. Or what's that word? What's that word? Special friend? Yes, special friend. (laughs) Thanks, Eugene. Yeah, thanks, Eugene. We just got to just our nod to Eugene. Mm -hmm. I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you mm-hmm. forever. Verse 17, He is the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept Him because it neither sees Him nor knows Him, but you know Him. Mm-hmm. For He lives with you and He will be, He will be, this is Jesus now pointing to this John 
20 moment, yes. he will be in you. Mm -hmm. And then he comes back in John chapter 20, breathes on them and says, yes. receive the Holy Spirit. So we're going to walk through a couple of, a few of the functions of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. that's located right here in John chapter 14 through 16. Yeah. And the first thing that I'm going to lead off with is that the Holy Spirit is not just a subject to be studied. Yeah. The Holy Spirit is not just a topic for debate. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit is a living entity. The Holy Spirit yeah. is a third person of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is God. Yes. Right? Francis Absolutely. Chan wrote th this book, The Forgotten God. Right. Because it seems like in certain segments of Christianity, we have a lot of venerance for God the Father. We have a lot of uh, respect and appreciation, love and adoration for Jesus and His atoning salvific work. And then we just keep moving on. Like yeah. we forget that there is this third person, vital person of the Trinity. Yes. Living inside of us, dwelling yeah. inside of us, revealing Jesus and the Father to us. And so, I mean, that, that's, that's the first foot I want to take. Yeah. Is that the Holy Spirit is God and the Holy Spirit is one to know yes. and to come into living relationship with. Mm -hmm. And I think the flip side of that same coin, which you kind of already mentioned, that the Holy Spirit is not just a subject to be studied, but also the Holy Spirit is not a utilitarian force mm -hmm. to be wielded right, however right, we right. want. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, a force to be wielded. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but the Holy Spirit is the special friend. Yes. That, that the Holy Spirit isn't, isn't apersonal. That the Holy a Spirit yes. is a living being in the in a different way but just as much as Christ is alive. Yes. And the spirit is alive in us and I love so right where we stopped I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you before long the world will not see me any longer. And we see this in Romans too. Yes. That we have been engrafted into the family. Yeah. And Jesus even says other places, into the life of God. Yeah. Well, Jesus makes that possible, but how does that happen? Come on. The Holy Spirit the Holy is Spirit. how that happens. Yes. So the Holy Spirit is not a subject to be studied, but the Holy Spirit is also not an a personal force to be wielded by Come us on, with man. our authority. However, we want the Holy Spirit to wield his power like in some video game or something. Right, yeah. exactly. Yep. I just got to read these verses because mm. you made a nod to it. And there's some of my absolute favorite verses. Romans chapter 8, verse uh -huh. 14. Those who are led by the Spirit yep. of God are the children of God. Mm -hmm. And we don't oh, have yeah. to over romanticize or over spiritualize that. Those who are led, those that are in in concert yes. with the Holy Spirit, those that are paying attention to what the Holy Spirit is saying, and I'm getting excited now. This is good. Yeah, those that are in living union with the Holy Spirit, those are the children of God. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And then verse 15, the Spirit you received does not make you a slave, again, to fear. Uh, rather, the Spirit you received, mm -hmm. this Spirit that the disciples received when Jesus breathed on them, and He says, receive the Holy Spirit. What spirit did they receive? They received this spirit, the spirit of sonship, the spirit that brought about our adoption to sonship. And by him, we cry, Abba, Father. Some people who are newly saved ask this question a lot. How do I know that I'm saved? Mm -hmm. How do I know? It's this verse right here. It's the spirit of God himself dwelling within your spirit who bears witness, mm -hmm. who agrees with your spirit, who testifies with you. Son, you are saved. You are safe. You belong to a family. You're in a home right now. The Holy Spirit will bear witness with your spirit. You are a beloved daughter right now. You're not an outcast. You're not a foreigner. Mm -hmm. You're not a stranger. You're not an orphan. You are a beloved son and daughter, and you belong in my family. And it's the Holy Spirit who testifies with our spirit of that reality. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Dude. I, that's good. <laughs> let's, let's take a look here at a couple of other mm -hmm. functions of yeah. this Holy Spirit. And, you know, let me just make this very, very clear right now. Why are we even talking about this? This is not just some historical right. experience for these, these 11 guys. Right. And this is not just some kind of historical moment that died off with the, with the church, those 120. I mean, if we're just talking history, let's, let's, let's go do something else. Right. Yeah. This matters because everything that we're going to talk about 
who the Holy Spirit is and what the Holy Spirit does and did and will continue to do. This is for us right. today. This matters. So let's look at a few other verses. How about John chapter 14, verse 26? Yes. Want me to read it? Yeah, oh, you please. Read. Yeah. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I have said. Take that and run with it, man. Well, I mean, for one, here we have the advocate again, another advocate, as we just mentioned in verse 16. Yes. So now we, we have this reiterated that the advocate is, or the true friend, yes. is the one who is in the same way another advocate, in the same way that Jesus was, in the same character, yeah. in the same spirit that Jesus was to them, the spirit is to them and to us. Yeah. So another advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything that I have said. I think this is one of the key things that is easy for the extreme charismatics to forget mm. is that the Holy Spirit did not come to do something after the finished work of Jesus that is distinctly different from Jesus. Mm -hmm. it, there might be a way in which that is true, but the Holy Spirit comes primarily to testify and to further what Jesus did and what Jesus initiated and inaugurated. Mm -hmm. And we talked about this a minute ago, I think when I was setting this up, where I said something about uh, the, the new creation and the body of Christ. So, I mean, think about that as literally as we possibly can. If Christ is the head and we are the body, then we are continuing Christ's work. Well, how do we do that? We do that as the Spirit leads us in reminding us all the things that Jesus taught yes. and continuing to teach us more. I mean, another place in here, Jesus says, many things I have not been able to teach you, you bet. but the Spirit will. The Spirit will. So the Spirit, one, continually reminds us and draws us back to Jesus. If, if we forget that, I think that is where we get into the dangerous territory mm. of, of doing things that are that are emotionally substantiated and questionable yeah. uh, in accordance yeah. with, are these really being led by the Spirit? The Spirit will always lead us in the way of Jesus, the way of in Jesus. the teaching yes. of Jesus. So, so that's in one. In the Spirit and in the truth yeah. and in the manner of Jesus. He will not deviate right. from that. Right, absolutely. He cannot he deviate cannot. from exactly. that. Exactly. I love yeah. that. You know, a couple of thoughts there to what you said is, number one, uh, we have need to be reminded. Yes, we do. <laughs> right? We have need to be reminded. And in addition to that, as we reflect, as we learn how to think deeply, guys, this is, this is why spiritual formation practices, this is why church calendar, mm -hmm. this is why reading the same passage numerous times is so beneficial yes. and so important. Because not only do we have need to be reminded, but the truth and the wisdom of God is so beyond us that the Lord, the Holy Spirit reveals this to us incrementally in waves, right? right? Yes. I mean, gosh, it. I would love to just read it and get it and move on. Right. That's just not the way that it's designed. Yeah. And that's just not the way that I've been hardwired. And when I say I, I mean all of humanity, right? right? Our limitation our, our, our developmental limitation mentally, psychologically, yes. emotionally, spiritually, we can't fathom everything. Right. And Jesus understood that and he was at peace with that. But he said, listen guys, physically, mm -hmm. I can't continue living with you. I'm gonna send you the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit will continue to nurture you, disciple you, mentor you and reveal to you the way of the kingdom yep. and the life and truth that I'm revealing to you as you continue to walk in communion with Him, mm -hmm. right? Here's another thought here. You know, Paul makes this reference in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and he's talking about things that are spiritually discerned. Oh, yeah. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, let's look right here at verse 9. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. These are the things that God has revealed to us by His Spirit. I think we have to understand one of the reasons why Holy Spirit is so important 
is because we cannot discern the truths of God on our own. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. Fallen human nature, reading things with just the power of our own intellect, we will miss with just human conventional wisdom, we will miss the wisdom of God. Right. Right? Yeah. Because these things must be spiritually discerned mm -hmm. and they must be spiritually revealed, which is a grace and a gift of the Holy Spirit living to us. The rest of these verses are very, very good. I encourage you guys to read them on your own. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God, and He makes these things known to us as we live in concert and communion and in submission to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Well, I love one of the words that you said, you said discerned, and I think you said it a few times. And I think that is so important. Well, for one, we believe that that is one of the primary ways that the Spirit is at work in us as, as a local church yes. and as the church of God in the world. In the world, right. And, you know, we see that this story, I, I love to talk about it, the story when Jesus is with Peter and the disciples and says, who do men say that I am? And Peter answers correctly. And Jesus says, good. you could not have known this if it were not revealed to you by the Father. Yeah. And then the very next passage we see, I believe in, in Matthew or Matthew and Mark, we see um, almost immediately that Jesus is alluding to being crucified. And Peter stops him and says, no, Messiah, that doesn't happen to Messiah. Right. And so Peter had this revelation, but he didn't have the discernment yeah. to know where his agenda and his will met with that revelation. Right. Because he took the revelation that was Jesus affirms, this is real revelation that has come to you by the Father. But then what do we have to do with real revelation? It must be discerned. So we don't just wield it and appropriate it and assume that we know exactly what everything means. Yeah. Even when we hear from God rightly, right. that there is still a discernment so that true. is required. Yes. A way of, and, and this is one of the things, so bringing this back to Pentecost and ecclesiology, why yeah. the church yes. is so important. Because the Spirit is not just at work in me yes. or in you, but in us. In us. Individually, of course, but yes. corporately. Corporately, yeah. past, present, yeah. past, and, you know, present and past. Yes, absolutely. Right? So the same Holy Spirit that's living in you is the same Holy Spirit that has been living in theologians and scholars and yes. missionaries and martyrs yeah. throughout all of church history. Absolutely. And, it, and, and that same Holy Spirit has been given to help all of us collectively discern yes. what is it that the Holy Spirit is saying. Absolutely. H how do we interpret rightly the words of Jesus? Amen. Yeah, I yeah. love that. Let's take a look at another verse, shall we? Yes, sir. Only for the sake of time. I could, I could sit on this all day long. But why don't we uh, now jump to the next chapter, John chapter 15, uh, 15 yep. verse 26. When the Advocate comes whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, He will testify about me. He will testify mm -hmm. about me. Let's talk about that a little bit. You know, so if, just looking backwards here, you know, looking at the John 14 passage, the Holy Spirit is the one who dwells within us. Mm -hmm. he, is, he is not a subject just to be studied. He's not someone just to give lip service or a nod to. He is the living God dwelling inside of us who invites us into communion and fellowship with Father yes. and Son. John chapter 14, verse 26, that He will reveal the things that Jesus has said. So the Holy Spirit reveals. He is a revealer. Yes. Uh, now here we see that the Holy Spirit testifies. What does it mean to testify? It mean, the word simply means to agree with, mm -hmm. to bear witness to. Yeah. And he, will, and he will testify rightly to who Jesus is. Yes. And this is so important. I mean, you know, for those of you guys who know church history, man, when the church first began, uh, it was riddled with so many Christological heresies. Mm -hmm. It was riddled with so many ideas. You know, Jesus was fully God, but He wasn't fully man. He was fully man, but He wasn't fully God yep. and everything in between. And here Jesus is saying, listen, the Holy Spirit is going to testify to the reality of who I am. And what does that look like today? Why is that so important? Why does that even, why would even Jesus say that? Yeah. Well, so I think there's a really simple practical way or a really theological way. And I'm going to go with the really practical, simple way to talk <laughs> about this. I think, well, for one, very real, being real is none of us have seen Jesus. Mm. That. I mean, for us, this, it, is, it is hope, it is faith, yeah. 
It is faith, not, not that we have conjured up or created ourselves, yeah. but how is it that we are in the church for 2,000 years? I mean, you know, at most 50 years after Jesus' ascension, nobody had firsthand witnessed Jesus. Let's be generous, we'll say 75 years. Yeah. But yet the church has been strong and thriving for 2,000 years. Well, if that's purely off of memory, I don't think it works. Wow. I don't think it's just because we remember that way back when somebody did something that was really awesome that nobody else had done. Yeah. I think that that might have lasted for a little while. So good. But I think it's the spirit that is testifying within us. Yes. That is causing believers 2,000 years later to shape their lives differently, how we spend our time, how we spend our money, what we do on Sundays, how we care for not just our neighbors and those who love us, but our enemies and those who hate us. I mean, so we can't do that just off of memories of teachings of a guy 2,000 years That's right. ago. That's fantastic. Those were powerful, Yes. but they're only possible for us because of the Spirit. The Spirit yes. has made it possible for us to live in that way. I love it. So It's fantastic. Yeah, yeah let me add to that. Um, and, and I want to speak specifically to those that are within the realm and the field that God has called me to, within the realm and the field of the, you know, Pentecost, broader Pentecostal charismatic world, more narrowly kind of the apostolic and prophetic stream that mm -hmm. I've been immersed in for the past 15 years uh, of my life, wonderfully, delightfully, joyfully, mm -hmm. um, unregrettably. I'm so appreciative of the many amazing aspects that this stream has brought to the larger body, revelation of the kingdom. And yet, while saying that, I also want to say that if we're not careful, as much as, 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 much as this arm of the church um, celebrates the Holy Spirit and the power dynamic and the gift dynamic, uh, mm -hmm. and as much as they've redemptively worked to bring that back in to the greater body, um, the Holy Spirit testifies to Jesus. Right. The Holy Spirit testifies to Jesus. So anytime we become more enamored mm -hmm. with a gift right. or the gifts in general, or anytime we become more enamored with what we are doing in the Holy Spirit, with the Holy right. Spirit, and somehow, some way it gets divorced from Jesus, we have to evaluate that. Mm -hmm. We have to check that. We have to check ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, if, if we go weeks or months um, having amazing experiences and encounters in the Holy Spirit, right. and yet there is never any testimony to the person in the work of Jesus, we have to evaluate mm -hmm. that because the Holy Spirit testifies yeah. to Jesus. If, if we become more, now I'm getting on a sidetrack, but, but, but think about this. I mean, if we become more enamored with uh, what is the prophetic word that is going to nail the ending of COVID? And we don't talk about Jesus. Yep. We have to evaluate that. Yes. And it's one of the beautiful things. Hey, let's just keep going on here. You know, the Holy Spirit will never take us away from Jesus. Right. And the Holy Spirit will never take us away from Christ's church. Right. Yeah. Right. So if we develop some type of theology or belief system that is me and the Holy Spirit are enough, that is where really unsound, yes. heretical, uh, unbalanced, dangerous things happen, mm -hmm. right? Part of the church, uh, the, the, the church's purpose is to help protect us in discerning what we yeah. think the Holy Spirit is, right? right? Mm -hmm. And what the Holy Spirit is saying. And so I don't, the Holy Spirit's not going to lead us into something that's going to be divisive. Right. Right. It might be something that we have to uh, discern together, but it's not going to be something that's going to be divisive. The Holy Spirit's never going to take us away yeah. from the very thing that He birthed mm -hmm. into the earth. And I know some of these things might be a little controversial, but I also think that they're very balancing. And I, and I think we need to hear yeah. these things today. Safeguards for us. They're, they are yeah. safeguards for us. Yes. Yeah. I agree. All right. Testify to Jesus. Testify to Jesus. All right. Let's 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 take a look here at another 16? verse, chapter 16. Hmm. Do, do we want to tackle? Well, I don't know. <laughs> let's, let's skip over here to uh, 16, 13, yeah, shall we, for now? Yeah, that's a good now? one. Yes, sir. 
Uh, verse 12, I have much more to say to you, more than you can bear now. Verse 13, but when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. Here we go again. He will not speak on His own. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of ramifications for that, yeah. right? The Holy Spirit will lead us to be under authority, godly mm-hmm. authority, Yes. right? The Holy Spirit will lead us into lives of greater submission. Mm-hmm. The Holy Spirit will lead us into lives of greater alignment, Yes. right? The Holy Spirit's not renegade, right? Right. And, and we've got to be careful that we're not justifying a rebellious, renegade, independent spirit right. on the Holy Spirit because that is not the character Absolutely. and the nature of the right. Holy Spirit. Mm-hmm. He will speak only what he hears and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. This is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Yeah. I mean, one really simple thing that I think is easy to be overlooked on Pentecost Sunday from Acts and from John. I mean, in John one thirty three. Uh, we see that Jesus is the one who will baptize in the Spirit, that the Spirit did not uh, come on His own accord, Right. that even the Spirit was sent, Jesus was sent. And that, that just speaks to, it's easy to see, okay, Jesus, the Father did a certain thing before Jesus, and then Jesus came and did a certain thing, and then now the Spirit comes to do a certain thing. Where, yeah, they're all in alignment, but, but really in our minds, they're, they're not. Yeah. That is not the case. Like, it, especially in John, we see that they're constantly pointing to one another, that no one member of the Trinity yes. is doing anything Come apart on. from the other two. Absolutely. That they are conjoined and enjoined in such a way that they're constantly, that, that the Spirit is being sent by the Father through Come the Son. Yeah. And the Son was sent by the Father, empowered by the Spirit, and came under the authority of the Spirit at His own baptism. So there is nothing renegade about the Spirit. Yeah. And then one of the bold claims is that now we have been brought into that. Yeah. So therefore, there shouldn't be anything renegade about us. Come on, man. Could so, you imagine? Could you imagine the Holy Spirit saying, yeah, I know Jesus said that, but, but here's what I say. Right. Or, right. or could you imagine the Holy Spirit saying, all right, all right, boys and girls. Yeah. There's a new sheriff in town. Let's get this show started. <laughs> right. right. I mean, like, just, just imagine that. It's comical to it say. It is comical. And it's comical because it's so absurd. It is. And yet that's the way that it, that's the way a lot of people live their yes. lives. Yep. Right. It's not in a, a fellowship of mutual submission. Yes. It's not in a fellowship. Could you imagine the Holy Spirit bad-mouthing Jesus? No way. Could you imagine the Holy <laughs> Spirit tearing down, demeaning, dishonoring uh, the Father? It's, 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 it's preposterous right. to think about. Yeah. And yet, and yet, we do that and we blame the Holy Spirit on it. Like, I'd like for us to see the contradiction. Yes. Sorry, I know this is, yeah. you, you did not know we were going to go No, here. but it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> hey, let me, let me, make a, let me, let me yeah. connect a couple of dots here and then, um, and then we'll, wrap this, we'll wrap this show up. John chapter 16, verse 7. Jesus says, very truly, I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the, whole, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him mm-hmm. to you. And now we're just, we just want to tie in John chapter 20, receive the Holy Spirit. This would not have been possible had Jesus not gone away. Mm-hmm. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, this would not have been possible. Right. Had Jesus not gone away to send the Holy Spirit to birth the church, to enliven the church, to animate the church, to sustain the church, this would not have been possible. And then let's look over here at John chapter 14. John chapter 14. I love how there are so many things that John is connecting here in just these few verses. John chapter 14, verse 12. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these. Why? Because I am going to the Father. John chapter 16, verse 7. If I don't go to the Father, the Holy Spirit cannot come. If I go to the Father, I can send you the Holy Spirit. And when I send you the Holy Spirit, you will do the works that I have been doing. Mm -hmm. And so there's so many things. I mean, time does not allow for us. So the Holy Spirit invites us into that beautiful, intimate relationship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
and the Holy Spirit dwelling within us empowers us, anoints us, strengthens us to live out the mission of God in the earth. Mm -hmm. So those things that Jesus did, Matthew chapter 4, 23 says, Jesus went around preaching, teaching, and healing all those that were sick and oppressed by the devil. We are empowered. We are anointed to do those things yep. by the Holy Spirit. We are anointed to preach good news to the poor. We are anointed to open the, the blinded eyes. We are anointed. Jesus says, the Spirit has come upon me to declare this is the year of the Lord's favor. We are anointed to do these things based on John chapter 14, verse 12, yep. that we will do those things that Jesus has been doing because Jesus has gone to the Father and sent out His Spirit to us. Yes. Yeah, it's like, <clears throat> you know, in John, we, we see Jesus say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And there is a way of reading that, a way, pun intended, uh, <laughs> of seeing Jesus just as the model exemplar. Mm -hmm. Like Jesus, Jesus did this, and so there is that famous book called The Imitation of Christ. Right. Like, so we mimic and we imitate. But I think, I think that kind of gets at it, but it misses something that I think is really crucial. That Jesus, of course, did what only Jesus could do, but Jesus is a way also. And now the Spirit is inside of us, yes. empowering us to live in that way. So it's not just Jesus did this, now mimic and imitate and follow. It's now the Spirit of Christ is alive in us and we have been brought into Christ to live yes, in His way. Outstanding. And what was Jesus' way? Yes. Jesus' way was mission to the world yes. constantly, over and over and over again, yes. in all four Gospels uniquely. Yes. But Jesus was God with us for the world. Dude, now you're just opening up a whole nother, so, whole nother can, right? Yeah. So, so can I just add one thought Please. here to this? Um, because again, Add you two. know, I, I will, I probably will, and you're going to tell me to <laughs> pipe down. You know, again, just some safeguards here, because we live in such a binary, dichotomous realm of thinking. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like the Holy Spirit is only for the supernatural right. and the sensational, oh, right? Yeah. But the same Holy Spirit that enabled Jesus to forgive His enemies on the cross, mm -hmm. right, is the same Holy Spirit who enables us to forgive our enemies, right? Right. So we're talking about the way of Christ, mm -hmm. the way of Christ. And I want to, I want to be clear here that the empowerment of the Holy Spirit is not just for power encounters, right? Right. The power of the Holy Spirit is to help us love our neighbor, mm -hmm. to be mindful of the least of these, to yeah. care about the work of justice mm -hmm. in the earth. That is, that's the work of the Holy Spirit inside of Absolutely us, right? Yep. To stand up for the voiceless, mm -hmm. it requires courage. Yeah. And where does that courage come from? I believe it comes from the enabling, emboldening power of the Holy Spirit who dwells inside of us. Mm -hmm. And on and on and on it goes. I think we need the Holy Spirit to be uh, great husbands and great wives. Yeah. I think we need the Holy Spirit to say, babe, I'm sorry. I missed it. Yes. I messed up. That requires power. Yes, I think our singles need the Holy Spirit to continue to live pure and faithful lives before God in an over-sexualized, adulterous, mm -hmm. infidelity culture. Right. We need the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit has been poured out for all of these things. Absolutely. Did I just open up another can for you too? Not really. I mean, I would just continue it with, with the, we live in a culture where, you know, some of the, the sins that are not quite so spoken of, sins of pride and greed yeah. and the desire to climb the ladder at all costs. Right and to ascertain power and authority. And I, I think that there are ways to do those things that are Christ-like, yeah. but even the desires themselves need to be examined before the Holy Spirit. Love it. So absolutely so good. agreed. So good, man. Thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you. Thank you for the time and work that you put in so faithfully when we have these conversations together. You too, Pastor. Thank you so much. Friends, today I, I pray and I hope that our talk um, on who the Holy Spirit is, is just a teaser. Mm -hmm. I hope it is whetting your appetite to know Holy Spirit, Amen. to have vibrant living communion with the third person of the Trinity. I pray today that that same experience that happened at Pentecost 
that you would experience the outpouring and the infilling of the Holy Spirit to dwell within you and to come upon you. I pray that the Holy Spirit in your life draw you into that fellowship with Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that it transform your life in that environment of love and grace and peace and beauty. I pray the Holy Spirit continue to reveal Jesus, the person of Jesus, and the truth of who Jesus is, and the way of Jesus to you. I pray the Holy Spirit empower you, friend, for everything that you are doing as a faithful witness to who God is in the earth. I pray the Holy Spirit empower you for your workplace. I pray the Holy Spirit empower you in your home with your roommates. I pray the Holy Spirit empower you for the Facebook posts. I pray that even this week, When you write something that you know is not representing God, the Holy Spirit will be right there to say, let's reword that. Let's do that in such a way that it is is appetizing the hearts of men and women to draw near to God. Friend, today, I pray that the Holy Spirit would be upon you in such a real and undeniable way in Jesus' name. Church, as we come to the table today, in light of what we just discussed around Pentecost Sunday, this is one of the ways that the Spirit continually leads us back and reminds us of who Jesus is and brings us into encounter with the living Christ, the Son of the living God, who is currently presently resurrected and with the Father. So as we receive these elements, we don't just remember the work of Christ. Of course we do. But we also believe that the Spirit is at work making Christ present to us and making these very real, tangible things the work of God in us for the world. So as we receive of the body of Christ and the blood of Christ today, know that even if we don't sense it or even if we don't Mm. feel it experientially, that the Spirit is at work and that Christ is risen, He is alive, interceding for us and working in and through us for the sake of the world. And that is all happening in these elements when we participate in Holy Communion. Amen. Would you take a moment now and pray together with us before we receive the elements. Holy Spirit of the living God, we invite you into this moment. And we know that you are present. We recognize and we realize that we are not the host of this table. Mm -hmm. Jesus, you are the host and you invite us to this table to experience Holy Communion, to experience living fellowship with you, and to receive grace afresh and anew. So Holy Spirit of the living God, we ask today that you would come and that you would do what only you can do with bread and with cup, and that you would make these unto us the body and the blood of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. I want to lead you today as you have your bread, your wafer, your cracker, And we're going to break these together now. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is the body of Christ. Friends, let us take and let us eat. Thank you, Jesus. And in like manner, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Receive this. And every time you drink of this, do this in remembrance of me. Let us receive the cup today, friends. Jesus, thank you today for your life and for your death. Thank you for your sacrifice, the price you paid. Jesus, as we come and we receive of the body and the blood of Jesus, we come in a state of gratitude and humility. We also come to you, Jesus, confessing our sins. We come recognizing that we have not lived up to your holy law. We come recognizing that we have sinned against you and we have sinned against one another. 
with the things that we have done and with the things that we have not done. And we ask you to have mercy on us and we receive mercy. So friends, today as we have come to the table, I declare over you this statement of absolution, your sins are forgiven. Receive the grace and the peace of God in Christ's name. Thanks for joining us today. We'll see you next week.